local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. This is KRWG Public Media, TV, radio, online, news that matters. Now, across the Mesilla Valley and the borderland, the stories that shape our community. From the KRWG Broadcast Center at New Mexico State University, this is Newsmakers. Thanks for joining us on this special edition of Newsmakers. I'm Fred Martino. In partnership with the League of Women Voters of Greater Las Cruces, we've invited New Mexico candidates to join us in advance of the November election. Today, the lieutenant governor's race. The lone response to our invitation, the Democratic candidate, State Senator Howie Morales of Silver City. Good to have you here. Glad to be here once again with you. Thank you. It's good to, good to see you in person. Sometimes when I'm interviewing you, you're up in Santa Fe talking about work in the Senate. Now you hope to become the next lieutenant governor of, of New Mexico. And while I'm going to have a lot of questions from the League of uh, Women Voters of Greater Las Cruces, I want to open with that, your decision to uh, leave the Senate and uh, run for lieutenant governor. Yeah, thank you. And it was a difficult decision that I had to make. I made that in December. And the reality of it is that in New Mexico, we've been struggling. We see where we're at with our economy. We haven't recovered from the recession. Uh, jobs have been very scarce. Our education system has been really struggling as well, as well as the healthcare environment of our, of our state. When you look at all those issues and wanting to see how we can change the direction of New Mexico, that's why I chose to, to run as Lieutenant Governor, to utilize my experiences in the State Senate, specifically in the Finance Committee, to help address these issues, working together with the Governor and bringing in policies that are going to help the people of the state of New Mexico. So I wanted to bring in momentum, wanted to bring energy and experience to the ticket, and at this point we've seen that that's been really what's been taking place. Okay, you mentioned the economy, and I know we've talked about this before. There are some folks who believe that one of the issues that needs to be addressed to boost the economy is our tax system. And uh, the first question from the League of Women Voters, is there an alternative to the gross receipts tax to raise revenues? And if so, what would it be? I think that was a concern. Over this last administration, you've heard that they weren't going to raise any taxes. And the reality of it is decisions that have been made have, been, have done exactly that. They've raised taxes on local governments, raising the gross receipts in order to give a corporate tax cut where we haven't seen the benefit of those dollars coming into the state. We need to make sure that we can uh, broaden the base, having more revenue streams coming into the state of New Mexico. We're not so dependent on just one area. Um, as we see right now, depending on the oil and gas revenues that come in, uh, we're going to have a huge windfall that, that we'll see coming in in this next legislative session. But it's about those years when the production isn't at the levels that they are now that we really struggle. And having a more of a base that we can have uh, that's more steady is going to be important that we do that. So when you look and see alternatives to the gross receipts uh, opportunities and the taxes that are there, I think that we need one is make sure we can take care of local governments as best as possible, but also making sure that we can broaden that base where we can bring in other revenues. This is the year to do it. We have money that we can invest in our infrastructure where we can have the renewables, the, the solar, the wind, opportunities to bring that revenue in. Now's the time to do it. Okay, so as you know, the major discussion that comes up with the gross receipts tax uh, is to close loopholes. Um, and some proposals would then say, if you close the loopholes, you can lower the rate. Uh, do you have any specifics on what you think should be done? We've had a lot of discussion on that mm -hmm. within the legislature, and I think that there are some loopholes that we need to look at. And I think that we have to do that in a very strategic way, not doing it a clear across the board as what has been attempted over the last couple of years that really would impact many people in our area in the agriculture uh, aspect, for example, or other areas that would be impacted when you do it clear across the board. It needs to be done strategically and specifically look at how we can have the base be broadened without impacting individuals or, or uh, industries that would really bear the burden of that. Okay, second question uh, from the League also deals with taxes. Should we raise the gas tax to help pay for improvements to our roads and other infrastructure? There's been, again, discussion on that, and, and we've had legislation that we passed through. Um, the reality of it is our infrastructure is really struggling right now. When we look at our water, our broadband, and our roads and bridges, 
New Mexico, if we're going to be competitive with other states, we're going to have to improve our infrastructure. Um, it's always a, a touchy subject when you talk about taxes and how we can bring in the revenue there. Um, and I'm hopeful that as we have the discussions going forward, that we again can see how we can bring more revenue in. You look at the gas tax, that's something that, uh, that I know the legislature has had support for. But we've got to find one way or another to have a revenue stream that we can build our infrastructure in this state. Okay, let's talk about uh, education funding. The state is under a court order, as you know, to improve education. Michelle Lujan Grisham says that if she is elected governor, she will not continue a Martinez administration appeal of that ruling. Uh, in your view, how should we address education funding as a state, and we should say that you are an expert in education, you hold a doctorate in education. I, I do, from New Mexico State University, I'm proud of that. Go Aggies. Um, absolutely. But I we wanna, have this in common. <laughs> we do. I, I do believe, and I, and I appreciate uh, Michelle Lujan Grisham's stance on stopping the appeal, because as a parent and as an educator, I, I take a tremendous amount of exception to that. Whenever you're going to deny dollars that are coming into our children, in our school systems, I think that it's wrong for PED and for the governor uh, to say that uh, we're going to appeal that. And so I fully support Michelle Lujan Grisham and wanted to make sure that no appeal takes place with this state. I believe when you look and see what has happened in the court ruling, we've known that for years as educators. We've seen that not only in the public school systems, but the higher ed and the early childhood side of it, that we've been starving our system and we've been asking for better results while we've been putting more burdens on but not giving the resources necessary to have those results be what they should be. So I completely see that this is an opportunity to really change direction in the state of New Mexico, provide the resources that are there to deal with our teacher shortage that is really impacting every single one of our school districts and then making sure that kids have more of an opportunity not to further standardize their education opportunities but to more individualize it and this is our opportunity to do so. Okay. Uh, early childhood development is important to the success of children in school. Uh, this is another part of a question from the League of Women Voters, and it's a statement made prior to the actual question. How would you assure that all children in New Mexico have the opportunity to participate in an early childhood program? I, I, that's one of the things that is really at the forefront of how when we look and see how we can deal with education. You've heard the debate as far as third grade retention and whether we should pass third graders or not. The reality of it is we focus on the intervention piece we're going to make sure and address these kind of needs early on because we know that third grade is too late to, to wait for that. I believe that we can have a universal system within our state, that we can have individuals who can go out, parents can go out to work and ensure that their children are being cared for properly and being educated along the way. I also believe that it's the best investment that we can make. Right now, currently in the state of New Mexico, we have the lottery scholarship where university students have the opportunity to go in and to have most of their tuition now paid for. But the reality of it is we're never going to give kids an opportunity to enjoy the benefits of a lottery scholarship if we don't start at the earliest childhood stages. So by shifting and having that focus at those early stages, we need to have a universal system that's going to ensure that we're keeping our children safe and educating them. And, and as you know, the challenge has been uh, how to do it. Because even a lot of people who agree with you and say we need to have universal early childhood ed, may not agree on how to pay for it. And the big proposal that's come up in the past, as you know, is to use money from the permanent fund. Is that something that we ought to do? I, I've always supported that when it's mm -hmm. come in front of us in Senate Finance Committee, and I understand the financial concerns that are there, but I also see what we're paying for right now. High cost of teenage pregnancies, high cost of our juvenile probation system, high cost in our corrections department. And so what we're paying right now could really be, uh, um, we can really help move the needle if we focus in on the intervention piece at the early childhood stages. The most critical stages of a person's life are those years. We need to invest in that and make sure that we can have the benefits show years down the road so we're not paying these dollars in the unfortunate areas that we are currently. Okay, here's another education question from the League. Would you support a law requiring a mandatory six-week summer session in school for all second language or other at-risk children in grades K through three. Why or why not? I want to make sure that we can give an opportunity for all children. 
to have uh, added opportunities for education. So I want to make sure, and the, and the court ruling that took place with the Yazzie case versus Martinez basically said that we weren't doing enough for individuals with uh, English language learners, special education students, at-risk students. So it kind of goes directly to this question, but I want to make sure that we're not just limiting, that we provide app opportunities for all children um, to have extended, extended learning opportunities. Our K3+, plus, perfect example of the results that we get when we give more opportunities uh, in the summertime programs, but I also want to make sure we can be uh, more broad and to give opportunities for all children there. Okay. You mentioned uh, in my first question to you as to why you were running for lieutenant governor, you mentioned health care. Mm -hmm. And this was another question from um, the league. Health care is a major issue. Uh, the Sunland Park City Council recently approved a measure asking the legislature to allow people to buy into the state's Medicaid system. Uh, do you support that idea, and what other thoughts do you have on, on health care? I have a background also in addition to my work that I've done in education and healthcare. The last nine years I was able to be uh, working in a hospital, and so I see the, the impact of what individuals have when you have to wait at the latest stages of your health care uh, needs, whatever they are. The more you wait, the longer you wait to be treated, the more expensive that that is. So we're really paying a lot of dollars currently to have individuals be treated in those extreme cases. I believe in the preventative side and to make sure that we can provide more opportunities on the preventative side to ensure that we're not having the high cost of what it costs currently with our healthcare system. So I do believe that. I do believe that we can have a system that has healthcare as a right and absolutely for individuals who may not have the dollars that were necessary to have their treatment, that they be allowed that opportunity to do that because it's not a system that we want to have or a country we want to promote that would give health care to only those who can afford it. Okay. Um, this is a, a very general question, uh, but it's, it's one that I know you've been thinking a lot about because you're, as we speak right now, as we're taping this uh, interview, you're in the middle of a jobs tour around the state. And the question is, how would you enhance economic development in New Mexico? I, and I, I appreciate that because as you stated, we've been doing our jobs and leadership tour across the state. We started here yesterday in southern New Mexico in Anthony, Sunland Park, uh, came to Cruces, ended up in Deming, started in Las Cruces, uh, in Lordsburg this morning on the way to Silver City, Tier C, and El Magordo tonight. The response has been tremendous. The energy that we've seen is people are hungry for that change, and jobs is at the top of their list. We want people to get to work. We want to make sure we're investing back in New Mexico. And I believe that when you talk about economic development, in many ways, I think we've missed the mark on that. We've tried to swing for the fences and try to go and give every tax break that we can give to lure any company to come into the state. They may or may not come, and if they come, they haven't stayed very long. I want to make sure we can have added to the discussion is the economic gardening aspect of it, where we have our small businesses and making sure that the tax system is working for their benefit to ensure that we're helping individuals start up businesses within our state and keep our college students here. It's making sure that we have a, an approach to jobs and developing that economic development system, not necessarily by looking outside, but seeing what we can develop from within as well. Uh, Michelle Lujan Grisham has talked uh, in very specific ways about certain things that she believes should be done to uh, enhance economic development. Mm -hmm. One of them you briefly touched on, which is renewable energy. Um, this is probably not surprising to folks who are watching this interview because they know that we have the highest potential uh, among, among many states in the country for solar and for wind. We're in that top five in that area. Uh, but some argue we're not doing enough to, to harness that. We don't have, in fact, uh, as you know, uh, as generous of tax credits uh, for individuals or businesses. We don't have a, a tax credit at all for people who buy, for instance, a, a plug-in vehicle. Uh, that may use solar power. I mean, there literally is the potential now, uh, folks who advocate for this, for folks to drive to work completely on the power of the sun if they have a, a good solar power system at their home. What specifically would you say about this, and do you agree completely with, with uh, Michelle Lujan Grisham's advocacy of, of renewable energy. Absolutely, and Michelle's been very clear and very specific 
in this campaign. Uh, she's talked about it many times in the, the tour that we've done. She has a 10-point plan that really goes into specifics of how we can create our economy, how we can make sure and bolster what we can do in the state of New Mexico. So I'm very proud of the plan that she's put forward and really believes in that we're going to have success with that. When you talk about the renewables specifically, uh, I can tell you, you know, I, I'm in a parade almost every weekend and there's sun that beats down on you, so there's plenty <laughs> of sun across the state of New Mexico that we can definitely It also harness. sells a lot of water in New Mexico, it, it, doesn't it? It does, but I, I also believe, like I stated earlier, that this is the time that we can invest. Over the last year, as we've just been in an economic downturn, under the Martinez administration, we just haven't seen that the benefits that have come into our state. Having this opportunity now where we're going to have some additional dollars to work with, we're going to have to be extremely disciplined as, a, as an administration, as a legislature, to ensure that projects that we fund are going to set the pace for years down the road to ensure that we can have the infrastructure in place now so we can have the benefits of the solar and the wind and those revenues that they bring in to help offset the down years of our of our uh, mining companies, of our uh, oil companies, of all those work that's being done right now that we're seeing, but those are so volatile, we need to have that stable base. Okay, do you feel like um, this is a challenge to advocate for renewables because I, I, I know that you've heard these arguments that um, when, when people uh, propose incentives for solar uh, or other renewables, there is sometimes pushback, but um, on the other side of it, there are folks who note that, we talked about gross receipts tax earlier, there are loopholes for gas and oil. So gas and oil have incentives. They're just different types of incentives. Uh, give me your thoughts on this, because th this is something we hear again and again. This is an opportunity again, a new day for New Mexico. We've gone through long years of this recession, and by doing the same exact things the way we've been doing, it's just not working for us. Mm -hmm. We see other states that have prospered and we've been left behind. We've got to make sure that we can be creative and think outside of the box, and I believe that this gives us an opportunity to look and see where can we invest, where can we choose to give tax credits that's going to give us the best return on our investment. The tax cut that was done back in 2013 that uh, lowered the corporate tax rate really was an impact, and it was a tax increase on every single one of us across the state of New Mexico without seeing the benefit. I believe that we can look and see, and we've had pieces of legislation that has passed that would give exactly that for those homeowners who want to invest in solar, for those car owners who want to move towards a direction of more energy efficient type of ways to do that. Um, we have to make sure that we're strategic, and I know that Michelle's been very supportive as I have, and our voting record has shown that to make sure we can think creatively to move New Mexico forward. Okay, many in the legislature have supported uh, incentives or uh, funding to increase broadband access in the state, particularly in rural areas where it may not be available. Um, this is a question from the league on a scale of one to 10, how would you rank broadband access in New Mexico? And what would you do to expand it? Right now, I think when you look at a scale of one to 10, I think that we're uh, probably maybe a four or five. We struggle as far as having the access and the ability for people to connect across the state, especially in the rural communities, and that's the areas that I primarily serve. You have your communities, your Native American, your, your tribal communities within the state also that is very much lacking. So our state, if we're going to be competitive on a worldwide market, we're going to make sure that we have to get us where we're competitively broadband with broadband. Not only that, you take a drive across the state of New Mexico and you have so many dead spots within cell phone service. This impacts business as well and this impacts quality of life and safety. So we want to make sure that we can have an opportunity to get New Mexico in the, in the century that we need to be in when it comes to technology. What are your ideas for sustainable management of New Mexico's groundwater aquifers? Yeah, I think that this is a tremendous issue within the state that we have to look at. When you look and see the importance of water, and I deal with it in my own communities that I serve with the, with the San Agustin Plains and the concerns there. Um, good opportunities to really look and see what some of the research has showed us in New Mexico Tech, for example, looking at our aquifers and how we can actually see and get levels of where we're at. I think that this is an opportunity for us to make sure we can utilize and work with our universities to help with that because this is absolutely vital for the future of New Mexico, that we have not only the brown broadband, not only the, the roads, the bridges, but also our water supply. Okay. Many of the questions that were submitted by the league deal with um, general 
uh, issues or uh, they, they don't deal with specific legislation. But our next question actually has been something proposed as a piece of legislation. It did not pass, but I want to get your, your thought on this. Are you in favor of a full-time legislature with legislators being paid a salary? You know, I can say this and, and hopefully going to move out of the legislature. I've served there 12 years and see the, the way that that works. New Mexico is the only state right now that doesn't have a paid legislature and is basically a citizen legislature of individuals who volunteer. I have tremendous concerns with that um, simply because when you go in a 30-day session or a 60-day session and you're expected to do the work during the interim on top of having a full-time job, on top of other responsibilities. I, I just don't think this is working for the state of New Mexico very well. I think you look at our rankings and you see decisions that are made at the legislative level that often are rushed. I, I would prefer to see that the state would move into a direction where they can have a, a legislature that can more fully devote their time to the office that they hold. Okay. This one is uh, one that is controversial for some folks, but polls show 60% support or more, depending on the poll, generally across the board, state polls, national polls, and I bet you know what I'm going to ask you. Do you support allowing voters to decide on legalizing the sale of recreational marijuana in New Mexico? Yeah, and I think, again, these are discussions that we've had in the past. And, you know, when I ran for governor four years ago, this was pretty new, and it was a pretty new concept. Colorado was just looking forward to, to passing that or, or enacting that. Um, and, and I supported that. And I think that when you look and see the, the benefits that may be there, um, I am open to that. And I believe that you look and see as far as the, the use of medical cannabis. I think I know that Michelle is extremely supportive of that and having the opportunity to see what we can benefit from. But I want to be clear that whatever revenues that may come from that, that we utilize revenues, if passed and signed by the governor, that we utilize those revenues to help us with substance abuse uh, uh, issues that we deal with, with homelessness, with um, programs such as suicide, things like that, that we can definitely utilize these dollars for, because we know that we have a broken health, uh, behavioral health system. In order to rebuild that behavioral health system, we need the revenue to do that. And I think this could be a possibility to give us those revenues for that. Okay. This one uh, is a uh, question that, that often we don't get to in forums like this, but it's something that was, again, uh, submitted by the League, and it's an important issue. Uh, much of the funding, however, uh, comes from the federal government for this, although there are state funds spent on this. How should we fund public transportation within cities and counties? I think that we've unfortunately put cities and counties in a real difficult spot when I say that we push the tax burden down to the local lo local levels. Um, it's been a concern because we've taken away resources from our local governments, but I believe that a, a public uh, transportation system is necessary. When you look and see the amount of poverty that we have and the people across the state of New Mexico who may want to just get to work or just to get from one location to another, this is important that we have this because when you're looking at other cities that we're in comp competition with, those, those services are provided. When you look and see how we can fund it, we need to better support our local governments. We need to make sure that we can work as partners with them rather than taking away funding sources that they would utilize to provide services such as transportation. Fun, funding is always uh, connected to almost all of these questions. And you know, it occurs to me that because I've had the chance to interview you before, um, on numerous occasions, you have made proposals where you have had very specific funding uh, requests, and one of them uh, actually has broad support from the public, which was an increase in the tobacco tax, um, but yet it, it, did, it did not pass. Um, give me a sense of, of, of the complexity there, because you've been a legislator for a long time, and if you're elected lieutenant governor, how you'll try to move some of these things forward? Because a lot of this does take money. There were several reasons why I proposed that piece of legislation. One of the reasons was because I knew we were underfunding our public education system. 
and this would have brought in an additional 89 million that would have gone to our school systems to address the major issues that we're dealing with in underfunding of that. Also the health care costs that we pay currently when you look at the cost of tobacco use and the health care costs that come with that, it would have definitely uh, assisted us with our Medicaid payments for example as well. Um, but when you look and see what opportunities that we have moving forward, we need to have all options on the table. How we can look, and that was the, you know, one of the first things we learned in the problem solving method. What is the problem? What are the causes? What are all possible solutions? And what's the best solution? This could be one of those opportunities, and I would hope that a legislate, uh, one legislator, whoever would come in, if I'm fortunate to be in the lieutenant governor's office, that would bring that forward, and we can have that discussion, that healthy debate, and for the legislature to decide uh, whether that should go through. Because we see that taxes aren't always popular with the public, but this one specific uh, proposal receive broad bipartisan support of something that we can increase to bring more dollars into our classrooms. Okay, uh, g give me a sense because uh, in addition to yourself, Michelle Lujan Grisham has a lot of experience in government. So she has worked in state agencies, led state agencies. She also, of course, has been a congressperson. Um, how important is this in terms of your success if you are elected lieutenant governor and for the next governor to be able to work across the aisle uh, to get things done. Absolutely, and you look and see the record that, that I've had in the Senate and the record that Michelle has. I mean, how fortunate are we in the state of New Mexico to have the possibility of electing a governor like Michelle Lujan Grisham who has experience from the local level as a county commissioner who has the experience with pressing issues as senior citizens, as, as Secretary of Aging and Long-Term Services, who has the experience on the healthcare aspect of it with Department of Health, Cabinet Secretary, and then working in Washington to see how those works and all the funding sources that are available there. We have a wonderful opportunity to have an experienced person lead our state, and, and some would say the most uh, a depressed state uh, that we've seen in many years when you look at it economically. But I think that when you look and see what we can bring forward, I don't think anyone has demonstrated more of a willingness to work across the aisle than Michelle Lujan Grisham and myself. I think that it takes communication. You're not always going to agree on things, but having the opportunity to work in a bipartisan way is going to be key to moving the state forward. doesn't mean that we're going to always agree on everything, but I believe that we can have communication of how we can do this. And it's unfortunate because you do see that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Michelle Lujan Grisham's opponent has been saying about working across party lines, but the reality of it, the voting re record doesn't reflect that. When you look at Michelle's record, it absolutely ref reflects working uh, across the aisle. Okay, State Senator Howie Morales is running for Lieutenant Governor in New Mexico. It is always good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for joining us at home. Join us this week on KRWG Radio every weekday. It's morning edition from 5 to 9, fresh air at 11, followed by here and now, noon to 2, and all things considered 4 to 7. KRWG News is always online at krwg.org. We'd love to hear from you. Email us with your story ideas and video submissions. The address is feedback at nmsu.edu. For all of us at KRWG News, I'm Fred Martino. Have a great week. We'll see you next time on Newsmakers.